Order. Uh, good afternoon and welcome to this afternoon's meeting of the Northern Ireland Assembly Public Accounts Committee. Uh, can I just remind members that mobile, mobile phones must be set to airplane mode or turned off. It is not acceptable to put mobiles on silent mm -hmm. mode as they continue to interfere with Assembly recording. <coughs> this session is being recorded in video and audio and can be accessed live via online streaming and on the Assembly website or Democracy Live. So we move to agenda item one, which is apologies, and I, re I record apologies to Mr. Hilditch. Any other apologies? Okay, thank you. Um, agenda item two, then, are the minutes of the 13th of January, which are in your packet pages 8 to 16. Are members content that these are a true and accurate record of the meeting? And do I have your permission to sign them? Great. 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 Thank you. Uh, agenda item three, then, is declaration of members' interests. Members at each meeting, you are required to register relevant financial uh, and other interests in register of members' interests. Today's subject matters include investment in broadband, report into education attainment and addiction services. Do any members have any interest they wish to declare this afternoon? Mr. Banks. Declare an interest to the degree that uh, I have less than 30 megabytes broadband connection and I'm not listed under Project Stratum. Not sure that requires you to give an interest. But anyway, um, in, in terms of having made that point, any others? Can I declare uh, an interest as a governor in two schools, Belfast Girls Model and Edenbrook Primary School? Okay. Um, agenda item five, then, is correspondence, um, <coughs> which is page three of your pack. During the meeting this afternoon, we have Northern Ireland Audit Office officials, Mr. Kieran Donnelly, CB, the Comptroller and Auditor General, Mr. Tomas Wilkinson, Director, Mr. Conor McGeown, Audit Manager, and then joining us remotely, Mr. Kyle Bingham, the Assembly uh, Support Officer. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Members, I referred to correspondence stated the 17th of January 2022 in your pack, um, pages three from Mr. Shane Campbell, uh, ICBAN Chief Executive who has also written to the Committee on the 17th of June 2021 regarding the Northern Ireland Audit Officer's report on broadband investment in Northern Ireland. Mr uh, Campbell uh, welcomes the inquiry specifically that the Committee should pursue the recommendations coming out of the Northern Ireland Audit Office report. His correspondence has also been copied to uh, board members of ECBAN. Are members content to note? Content. Agreed. Thank you. Agenda item six, then, um, is the inquiry into broadband investment. Evidence session, pages 20 to 134 of your PAC. Uh, and the department officials joining the meeting today are Mr Mike Brennan, the Permanent Secretary uh, <coughs> and Accounting Officer at uh, Department for the Economy, Mr Nigel Robbins, Project Director of Project Stratum, Mr. Trevor Forsyth, Project Manager, Project Stratum. Mr. David Hamill, Project Manager, Superfast Rollout Project. Mr. Andrew Field, Program Director, Project Gigabit. And uh, Mr. Billy McLean, Area Development Lead for Northern Ireland. Also in attendance, uh, as I've said, is the Controller and Honour General. And joining us remotely is Mr. Stuart Stevenson. Mr. Stevenson, can you hear me okay? Yes, Chair, I can hear you. Thank okay, you. good afternoon. Can I just check that all of our uh, witnesses can hear and see uh, okay? Okay, sure, yes. I hear you fine. Okay, okay, thank you very much. Um, yes. Members, then I refer you to pages 20 to 134 of your pack regarding the relevant papers for the evidence session. The clerk's memo with additional questions, if needed, and details of the press release dated the 17th of January 2022 regarding extended coverage of uh, 8.5 thousand homes, pages 20 to 24. The Northern Ireland Audit Office report, Broadband Investment Northern Ireland, pages 24 to 115 of your pack. The Northern Ireland Audit Office briefing on Broadband Investment and Project Stratum, pages 116 to 129 of your pack. Details of the Department's witnesses at page 130 to 134 of your pack, 
and then in your table packet pages 80, sorry, 8 to 69, um, Northern Ireland Audit Office uh, Report Contract Award Management or Project Stratum Report. Um, so with your permission, members, Mr Brennan, I would invite you as the Permanent Secretary and Accounting Officer of the Department to make an opening statement, after which I will open the meeting to members for questions. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just hope that you can hear me okay. Yeah. I can hear you fine, thanks. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Chair. Um, well, good afternoon, uh, folks. Um, as the Chair said, I'm Mike Brennan, the Permanent Secretary in the Department for the Economy. And the Chair also indicated that we have a number of other witnesses with us today. Um, Nigel Robbins, the, the Project Director for uh, Stratum, Trevor Forsyth, the Project Manager for Stratum, and also Trevor Forsyth, who, or David Hamill, who was the Project Manager for the Superfast Rollout Project. In addition to those colleagues from DFE, we're also joined with two colleagues from BD UK, Andrew Field, who is the Program Director for Project Gigabyte, and also Billy McLean, who's the Northern Ireland Area Leader for, um, for uh, BD UK. Chair, at the outset, I would just like to say that um, our departments welcome the audit office reports into broadband investment in Northern Ireland um, and also Project Stratum. It's always valuable to have independent scrutiny of any government funded projects to ensure that best practice is being followed and to inform future policy in area, any area of our department's endeavours. DFE, as you know, is always open to considering all possible options and exploring whether and how government should intervene in supporting improvements in our broadband infrastructure. The DCMS representation here today is actually critically important because as you know, telecoms policy is actually a reserve matter, and DFE has only a very limited role um, under the 2003 Communications Act. Um, so much of the discussion today will actually probably focus on what our reserve policy matters. A uh, starting point observation um, that I would make is that the, the recent projects delivered and that we're going to talk about shortly, um, delivered in partnership with BDUK, have already improved superfast broadband services to over 67,000 premises across Northern Ireland. Now, the economic and social benefits to businesses and citizens are, are well understood. Indeed, in 2018, the National Infrastructure Commission stated that digital connectivity was an essential utility, just like water or uh, electricity. This need for access to good broadband connectivity has never been a, a higher or better understood since the advent of COVID. So DFE as a department is determined to continue working very, very closely with BD UK and other key stakeholders to consider how best to take forward policy in this area. But the challenges for government are, are, are many faceted. Um, the challenges include the need to ensure that resources are used to best advantage in an area where technology is moving at an incredibly fast pace. There's also a need to predict what the needs of business and citizen will be over the medium to long term, and also to implement policy and projects within any applicable state aid compliance arrangements that exist. And finally, to stimulate commercial investment where there is a market failure, without at the same time substituting investment uh, that the private sector would have taken forward. As you know, Project Stratum is our current broadband intervention, and it's the largest publicly funded telecoms infrastructure project ever undertaken here. It's no exaggeration to say that Stratum is transforming the connectivity fortunes for all our citizens, but particularly in rural areas, where the lack of access to good broadband is particularly felt. In that context, it's important to remember that 97% of broadband or Stratum's intervention area is indeed local rural, area, local rural areas. Fibrous has already delivered gigaband, gigabit capable broadband to over 22,000 premises here ahead of schedule. But the audit office report and into Project Stratum is indeed timely. We, of course, welcome the, the positive references to contract award and management approval processes with the, the references to best practice techniques and procurement. And we also welcome the acknowledgement that the delivery fully complied with the 2016 National Broadband Scheme aid requirements. 
However, I think it's fair to say that it wasn't an easy procurement to deliver and the team had to address a number of complications that emerged from bidders late in the process. But the project progresses and indeed it's been enhanced. Just this week, it was announced that an additional £32 million of funding has been provided by UK government and the two devolved departments to see a further 8,500 premises now being made eligible. So I'll pause there, Chair, um, and look forward to the discussion as it uh, unfolds this afternoon. Okay, thank you. Do any other members of your team wish to make any additional remarks before I bring members in for questions? Uh, I would doubt it at this stage, Chair, but I'll, okay. I'll leave the, the mic open for confirmation. There's no, no one saying nope. anything. Yeah, uh, can I just ask, Mr. Brennan, before I bring other members in, um, in the NIB IP project, the audit office report shows a huge difference between the 117,000 properties that the department originally thought its investment improved, would improve broadband access to, to the actual amount of 37,500. Can I, can I ask you to, to explain to this committee, how did the department get that so wrong? Um, I'm not sure that I would say that the department got it wrong, Chair. What that f those two figures represent was the evolution of the procurement process. I'll, I'll bring uh, my colleague Nigel in in a second. But the, the figure of 117,000 was the department's initial assessment of premises that could be brought within scope at the very, very start of the procurement process when it was trying to identify what the impact would be in terms of coverage. But as the procurement process moved through its various stages and data became available, for example, on uh, the costings to deliver to rural areas in Northern Ireland um, and the extent of the rurality that exists in Northern Ireland. Also, the fact that we were moving to um, different degrees of technological upgrade um, and also a whole range of other cost items meant that the assessment of the premises that could be captured at the final stage of the, the, the procurement meant it was a much reduced figure. But I'll, I'll bring Nigel in now to elaborate and go into greater detail. Thanks, Mike. Uh, can everybody hear me? I, I noticed I was frozen on the uh, camera there, but is the audio coming yeah, through? I can hear you fine. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank, thank you. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm joined, as um, Mike outlined, by David Hamill, who's the project director for uh, the previous broadband projects. But it's true that the, uh, the process set out to capture um, all of the eligible premises, and the end result was slightly different from that. Um, we'll talk more about the project stratum process a little bit later. But, but David, perhaps you can take the committee through that process for the previous projects, please. Yes, certainly. The uh, original initial business cases for the NIBIP, the NIBA project, um, was one of the earliest projects under the framework contracts with BDUK. And uh, in preparing the business case, uh, one of the sources of data that we used in terms of trying to establish and estimate how much it would cost to intervene uh, in those rural areas was one of the previous projects the department had run successfully uh, which is the next generation broadband project um, and sort of the kind of ballpark costs and coverage that had been provided under that project um, formed part of the basis for the estimate of costs under NIBIP. Um, and that was where about 117,000 premises was initially thought that we would be able to reach with the funding available. Um, and in addition to that, the sort of level of contribution we might expect from uh, uh, the supplier. Uh, when the bid was actually then received uh, from BT, it was clearly a lot, <coughs> excuse me, considerably lower than uh, what we had originally uh, been hoping for. Um, uh, that bid then went through a, a detailed process of benchmarking and comparisons with about 40 other uh, projects under the same framework uh, contracts across the rest of the UK to try and establish whether the costs and coverage that were being proposed by BT were actually in line with what we're being seeing elsewhere. Um, it was established at the end of that process that they were. Um, so yes, our, our initial estimates were, were considerably out, um, but the department uh, used the lessons learned from that in taking forward then the follow-up project, the super fast rollout project. Uh, and in that case, 
we were much more conservative in terms of estimating the costs to deliver to these rural areas uh, and the likely contribution that we would get from the supplier. Um, and indeed, when we went out uh, to put it out, that one out to tender, uh, BT actually exceeded our expectations uh, because we had uh, so much reduced what we thought we would get. Yeah, I think I think considerably out is a much better term to use and slightly different as was initially used in the answer. Um, I don't think uh, a disparity of seventy nine thousand households is slightly different, with all due respect. Um, the Northern Ireland Audit Office report on broadband says that the department are due to receive fourteen million pounds from BT in terms of uh, a respective clawback. What are the department doing to actually get the money back? Once you've got it, what will you do in terms of spending it? Chair, the £14 million figure refers to clawback that applies to um, the two schemes, the NABIP and the SRP scheme. I think the actual allocation across the schemes are, I think it's £6.4 million of clawback due to NABIP and £7.6 million of clawback um, attributed to SRP. Um, that £14 million, um, however, isn't available to BD UK or the department at this stage um, because it's tied into when the con those two contracts, SNIBIP and the SRP, formally end. So, um, from recollection, the NIBIP contract formally ends, I think it's March 23, and the SRP contract, I think, formally ends in December 24. So um, there's an, an ongoing constant process of evaluation of what the gain share clawback mechanism would be. Um, I, 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 the colleagues can be elaborate, but from recollection, I think um, on NIBIP, there was approximately 1.7 million of a clawback, and that was then rolled into, I think, SRP. So the, the, the money is, is, um, is rolled forward depending on the status of the contract and is available for um, the executive and, and BDUK to use um, in future investments. So in terms of the £14 million, pounds, Mr Brennan, one of the contracts um, runs out in March 2023, the other in December 24. Would that mean that none of the £14 million pounds will be brought in before the, the beginning of 2025? I think, um, from recollection, I think of the £14 million, um, it doesn't all accrue to the executive. I think in total some £9 million of it accrues to the executive to be, to be reinvested, and the rest um, is for uh, allocation um, to BD UK to use. I think uh, somewhere in the order of £1.7 million of that clawback has already been utilised, but I'll, I'll bring David in now just to confirm that. Yes, um, thanks, Mike. Just to clarify the question, uh, the Nightmare project... Com a contract completes at the end of March 2024, and at that point we will get back uh, any clawback due from that project. We don't have to wait until so 24, 25. Mr. Hamill, Mr. Hamill, it's March 24, not 23. Is that what you're saying? Um, so I'll just check my. It's uh, March 23 for NIBIP. Yes, yeah. yeah, sorry, it is. It's March 23. March 23 for NIBIP. Uh, at that point, we get back the clawback for NIBIP. Uh, it's not until December 24 that we get the SRP money, but we don't wait till uh, December 2024 to get all the money back. Um, mm. And so, in terms, of the, the second part of my question was, how will you spend it? I mean, you, are you making plans to spend? Um, would you clarify as nine million pounds coming back to the Northern Ireland executive? Um, are you making plans to spend that money? The department gets back uh, nine million pounds, but it's not ring fenced for telecom, so it'll be down to the department, uh, indeed DOF, possibly uh, what the executive wants to do with that funding. Mm. But sure, the, 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 I suppose the, from a DFE perspective, we would do an evaluation of where we are in terms of project stratum and those remaining uncovered in terms of premises uncovered and the extent to which, for example, we would seek to ask the executive to utilise some of that to cover those individuals. Okay, I'm going to pause my questioning there and bring in Ms Hunter. 
Thank you, Chair. Um, I hope you can all hear me okay. Uh, and thank you to the panel for being here uh, this afternoon. Um, I'm based in a very rural constituency myself uh, in East Area, and I'm uh, in East Area, and I've seen um, the impact of poor broadband and how that's impacted our communities here, especially with the digital divide uh, and education throughout the pandemic. So this is a project I have a real keen interest in. So thank you for your comments and your clarity so far. And um, I just have two questions. One of them I noted in our packs uh, was around overbuild and about the potential for overbuild um, with broadband infrastructure uh, being upgraded for the same premises twice. I'm just wondering, I had seen the department has said it's managing that risk. Can you provide a bit more clarity around that for me, please? Thank you. Okay, I'll, I'll yeah, ask Mike. Nigel to address that, yeah. Yes, happy to address that, uh, Mike. Th thank, thank you for the question. Yes, there is a mechanism in the project stratum contract to uh, descope premises if there is a risk, for example, of overbuild or if uh, a premises is identified on the ground as, as derelict, you know, which sometimes happens with data, uh, and to descope premises, just as there is a mechanism to bring premises into scope. I can expand on that uh, if you wish, uh, related to a number of premises that uh, were indicated as commercially viable in the intervention area, but uh, there is a mechanism um, to address those premises that we feel are, um, are le eligible candidates to be descoped. The process that we have adopted, and we thank the NIAO for acknowledging the best practices that the department has uh, stood over that have underpinned development of Project Stratum, those same best practices have influenced key decisions at every point of the way, and that includes you know, challenging our own recommendations, uh, casework committee review, project board scrutiny, uh, advisory panel uh, through the procurement process, uh, Department of Finance uh, approvals before we even get to the BDUK state aid assurance approvals. That same mechanism has come into play here when we've been looking at premises that uh, some may say uh, our candidates to be descoped. Uh, our um, department or the department's uh, over arching aspiration is to maximize broadband across the intervention area to eligible premises, but to do so in a way that protects the integrity of the process, preserves the ring-fenced intervention area, which has been uh, created through the state aid, uh, open market review and public consultation, and taking into consideration additional information provided to us by a major infrastructure provider. So all of those things have been taken into consideration when making decisions or recommendations uh, for the department to consider. And, and we can stand over the target intervention area and feel that all of those premises are eligible for intervention. There will be a risk to those premises. They would be commercially uh, vulnerable in our mind, not commercially viable if they were descoped to the degree that uh, some have suggested. Uh, thank you very much, Nigel. And then I just have one further question, which is around the homes which will not have uh, their broadband upgraded. So I'm just curious, uh, within our pack, I think it was 3,400 uh, premises uh, now without a proposed infrastructure solution. Is that correct? And is this something uh, the department is looking into? For Project Stratum, the, at the point of contract award, there were 2,500 premises that uh, required further funding. Um, it, one thing you'll hear me say a lot is that the 165 million for Project Stratum was never a budget. We've always communicated this from the very beginning when there was 150 million from the Confidence and Supply Agreement. It's not a budget, but it is a terrific sum of money to address a problem and to close a broadband connectivity gap that has existed in Northern Ireland uh, for, for too long. Uh, I live in Northern Ireland. I'm proud to call Northern Ireland my home for 10 years, and I would like to see Northern Ireland leading, not playing catch up. And so that, uh, that sum of money helps us close the uh, predominantly rural uh, digital divide that has existed here. So two and a half thousand premises were out of scope despite 165 million and a 48 million investment from the successful bidder. And so we have a headroom funding provision in the contract which allows us to utilize funding of up to 35 million to go to a 200 million cap under state aid rules. And so we're always uh, considering to draw on that, and we certainly need to for the 2,500 harder to reach premises. And then we identified additional premises that were eligible. And so that was the announcement made this week to bring 8,500 into scope. So all but 37 premises that have been identified through this process are therefore going to benefit from gigabit capable broadband. The 37 premises are 
are hard to reach. They're all surrounded by bodies of water. But uh, the uh, successful uh, bidder, Fibrous, will be conducting site surveys this quarter uh, and to propose a solution. Um, but to address your question about other premises, there are some premises captured, if you like, in a process. As I say, the department, everything we do is aligned to strict protocols and a process. So there is a state aid process which says that if a uh, premises can receive a qualifying broadband service from a wireless internet service provider or WISP, then uh, we must give those WISPs every opportunity to show, uh, provide evidence and show that they can provide a robust, compliant, consistent uh, broadband service. And so there is this measuring period of three years after public consultation when we hold those WISPs to account and we're coming to the end of that process. So there are some premises where WISPs have claimed a service and, uh, and many of those WISPs have provided a very important service. Ten years ago, that was all that premises could receive. And so they have uh, every right to show that they can provide a service. If they cannot, if the evidence is not there at the end of that under review process, then the department uh, has the opportunity to consider recategorizing them as eligible for intervention. And so we're going through that process now. Uh, and that would capture um, all of the premises. There are some premises that have been dropped from um, a infrastructure provider's commercial rollout plans, which perhaps we'll come to later. Uh, we, we can say commercial operators can change their plans. Uh, there's nothing to stop them doing that, uh, but it can be frustrating. Um, data also needs constant analysis to ensure that the premises are, are not left behind. The only thing the department is focused on is that unwavering good governance process and to ensure that premises are not left behind. So we very much focus on the negative, if you like, all of the, all of the premises that uh, require solutions. So the under review uh, process, to answer your question, will draw its conclusions later this quarter. We'll have more to say about premises that have been dropped from commercial plans perhaps a little bit later. Thank you very much, and that, that really helps provide that extra detail. I'll just come back quickly, just on what you had mentioned there regarding homes still facing challenges in those more harder to reach areas. Is there a way to find out what kind of geographical locations those tough spots are, are at? Yes, I mean, it's safe to say uh, they're all pretty tough. I mean, this is quite a unique intervention area for Project Stratum because uh, we often say it's, it's over 97% rural, and that means the band H, Nisra, uh, categorization, which is uh, villages and hamlets of a uh, population of a thousand or less and sparsely populated countryside. As we all know, Northern Ireland is, is different to certainly England and other parts of the UK in that regard. We have the longest telephone line lengths in Northern Ireland, and we have four times more telegraph poles per capita here for those reasons, those sparsely populated premises. And so that's 97, more than 97% of the intervention area. Two thirds of those premises cannot access speeds of 15 megabits per second, let alone 30. And many uh, are on the lower end of that. And, uh, and as Mike stated, you know, broadband is a utility. In fact, many members of the team um, are in the same position. You know, we all are citizens of Northern Ireland and everybody deserves the very best uh, broadband service, regardless of where you live. So there are some harder to reach premises in that category of the two and a half thousand that we've now brought into scope. A little more time is required by the contractor to deploy to them because new infrastructure is required to get to them. The contractor will utilize existing infrastructure where possible, uh, renting from, uh, from BT, and there's a very good relationship, we're, we're told, between you know, the BT PIA, Physical in, in, uh, Infrastructure Access Team, and the Fibrous uh, Deployment Team. So that's a positive. Uh, and we all, want, we all want the same thing. I think it's also terrific for Northern Ireland that we have BT, Virgin, Fibrous competing against one another. We've got a dynamic here that has put Northern Ireland ahead of the rest of the UK with 77% of premises gigabit capable. Stratum will raise that to 87%. But in rural Northern Ireland, it's not, not the case. Uh, and in rural Northern Ireland, 30% uh, of premises can still not access uh, super fast speed. So that's what Project Stratum seeks to address. Okay, um, thank can, you. May I just come back to the query you had asked about overbuild. Um, we have been looking at it carefully. We have spoken to the supplier to ask if they have come across any evidence of overbuild in their network deployments to date. Um, and they're sort of, they're reporting to us they haven't seen any uh, 
effort that there is widespread infrastructure being deployed in the areas that they are currently operating in. Um, but it is something you know that we'll keep an eye on just ourselves, just to assure ourselves that is the case. Um, I think there's also the query that, as Nigel said, this is rural um, where there's band H of, of very remote, but this also does include some small uh, hamlets uh, and, and clachans, as they might have been called as well. So uh, what some people regard as rural might be, that, that might, you know, that's just to bear that in mind. But we are looking at this overbuild issue uh, just to make sure that uh, we, we can manage that. And just to touch on that finally, if I may, uh, when we were looking at the additional premises to bring into scope, uh, we didn't include those premises where we've received recent data to indicate that uh, there is a commercial uh, solution for those premises. So something like 2,000 premises were not considered. And less than 100 of all of the 8,500 premises that we've added, less than 100 are not band H. So that sets the you know, typical uh, profile of these, uh, of these premises. Uh, and we did establish uh, three years ago a forum for other uh, drivers of public uh, broadband intervention, including the teams uh, behind City Deals Development, uh, FFNI, our colleagues at DCMS and Ofcom. And the purpose of that was we said this is the poker game. It's in our interest to share information where we can, where the data allows and try and avoid any overlapping or gaps. And as a result of that, we did de-scope from Project Strassen some premises that the uh, full fiber NI team were going to pick up earlier. So you know, we're very much uh, looking at uh, the opportunities where we can de-scope and save uh, the public purse, but at the same time, uh, you know, very um, rigorously ensuring that the process is protected and that premises aren't left behind as a result of this much needed intervention. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, just in terms of quite a bit of mention has been made of premises. Mr. Mr. Brennan, question for yourself before, before I bring Mr. Muir in. Uh, how did the department go about identifying premises for improvement under NIBIP and SRP2? And how did you uh, work to ensure that only the targeting uh, upgrades of premises were not commercially viable? Okay, Chair, sure. I'll bring David in a second, but NIBIP and SRP obviously were a progression from the, the previous next generation broadband scheme that the department ran in 2009. We then moved on to the UK, uh, BDUK national framework um, and uh, uh, adhered to those framework guidelines. David, do you maybe want to give a um, greater insight into the, the definitions that we had to adhere to um, and, for example, the interrelationship with what was eligible for state aid? Yeah, certainly. Uh, BDUK had put in place uh, an open market review process, which all the local authorities had to carry out, whereby we determined right across Northern Ireland uh, all identifiable postcodes and how many premises were in every postcode. And then we did a consultation with all the key industry providers and asked them to provide us with detail on where they currently provide uh, access at super fast speeds and uh, what plans they have over the following three years to improve their infrastructure. We took that information and then carried out a public consultation on it to verify the information. It was then reviewed along with BDUK against uh, their intelligence on the market. And uh, out of that came premises that were actually eligible for improvement. The same process was done for both NIBIP and SRP and uh, an open market review process was also done for Stratum in the same way. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Mr Muir. Um, thank you very much, Chair, and thank you for um, everyone joining us in relation to this inquiry. This is, um, for me, an important issue because it's about the use of public funds and ensuring value for money has been secured. Uh, I have a couple of questions really around that. The, the issue for me is uh, whereby public money has been used to support the rollout of broadband, but whereby they actually that could have been done on a commercial basis and that public funds may not have been required. And I think that's the sort of the, the core of this inquiry and the core of our consideration here today around that. And I think it's important, first of all, to have an understanding from people uh, what lessons have been learned as a result of this uh, audit office report uh, in relation to the issues raised, and I would like to hear a bit more around that. 
The other one is in relation to the formula which was used for Project Stratum. And I really want to know why the department used such what I would consider a basic formula for the scoring in relation to that. I would have forecast to see a procurement process which would have been a bit more complicated to ensure a better outcome in relation to that and ensure that public funds were better safeguarded. So I really want to know from the department why such a basic formula was used. Uh, and the last sort of questions in relation to the LPS database, whether there was a significant number of properties missed around that. And I want to know what due diligence was undertaken in relation to that LPS database. Okay, so uh, a significant number of issues flagged there, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll deal with them um, as quickly as I can, and then maybe invite a few colleagues in. So on the first issue around value for money um, and um, intervening um, if in cases where you, you seem to be suggesting the private sector may have wanted to be involved anyway, you know, so in other words, getting involved when there wasn't a market failure. Um, the first the first point I would make is that um, the there's a radical difference between um, suppliers making commercial decisions in an urban environment and in a rural environment. And uh, the uh, private sector had stepped up to the plate, as it were, in terms of rollout of broadband in, in commercial settings in Northern Ireland. That, that clearly suggests there was no market failure in terms of providing in that, that, that environment. In the rural environment, as we've touched on already, um, the costs are significantly higher to the private sector to provide um, uh, acceptable standards of broadband okay um, and the imperative was to make broadband available to the rural community in Northern Ireland so there was a process we went through and it was a UK-wide process in terms of NIBP and an SRP to roll out broadband uh, in a standard way now, you know, the, the fact that BT um, was the only company on that framework during that period, well, it actually, it wasn't at the start. There were other providers there, such as Fujitsu, who decided to remove themselves from the framework. But there were other, uh, BT was left. Um, what I, I take comfort from the fact that um, in the, the, the case of the 11 cases, I think it was in total, where local bodies and GB decided to provide broadband uh, uh, out with the the UK uh, the BD UK framework, all of those eleven procurements um, ended up um, appointing BT. So BT um, was awarded those contracts through an entirely separate um, procurement process. That gives me one degree of comfort. The other degree of comfort I have in terms of the value for money aspect is that um, the there was a significant uh, clawback gain share mechanism built into the contracts. Um, that allowed um, the department to uh, undertake a scrutiny exercise to determine whether, for example, costs were eligible. And there had been, for example, a degree of super normal profit earned by BD. So, for example, if the costs incurred by DBT were lower than expected or the take up by premises was higher than expected, um, the, the taxpayer had a mechanism to recoup some of the investment. The other issue on VFM, particularly when we get into Project Stratum, was that um, there is a very, very significant um, checking mechanism built in by BD UK and the department in terms of verification and vouching of payments. And we can maybe get into the detail of how that works, but it is um, very, very reassuring from a taxpayer perspective how costs are actually approved. In other words, BT only get paid for what they actually do deliver. And as I say, these are investments um, significantly in rural and in extreme rural areas. Um, the, you make reference to a basic formula that, that, um, that determined how uh, the, the, the tender was, was awarded. Um, I'm, I'm not sure that I would accept the word basic um, because the, I, I think the audit office report um, doesn't um, fully um, detail the, the actual process um, that there was in terms of the um, 
scoring, waiting and scoring of the two tenders that come in under stratum. Um, there's, there, you know, there was, a, I know, I think it's Appendix 5 at the back of the, the Project Stratum report presents one table, but I'll maybe bring Nigel in to give you some significant more insight into the methodology yeah. employed um, and how, you know, the award of the contract of fibrous um, was across a number of different metrics, okay, um, and, and, and not just on one. So this idea that um, marks could go from 30% down to 29%, just on the basis of coverage making a single adjustment um, masks the other issues that were brought into play in terms of the weighting and scoring in the award. And then second, the final point that you, you, you raised, Mr. Muir, is in relation to the LPS um, database. And um, the pointer database, obviously, it's used as a by LPS um, for um, rates assessment and rates payment mechanism. So yes, you know it was never actually constructed for this particular purpose. But the you know and it's something that I've come across as well in relation to COVID COVID grant payments. The LPS database is very significant and useful database for the wider public sector, but it is constantly evolving, you know, and what we do is we take the evidence as that evolves, we take the evidence and that leads us to readjust where we are. And as Nigel has said, part of that readjustment process is I think it's somewhere in the order of 6,000 properties, I think, in the, out of the 8,500 in the announcement yes. made earlier this week, is as a consequence of reassessments of what the LPS pointer database was was suggesting us. But I'll go back to this point about the, the basic formula as one, I think, we need to maybe shed a bit more light on just to um, give you some yeah. comfort, Nigel. Do you maybe want to say why the, the, the calculations were Absolutely. much more complex? Yes, and if, if I may, Mike, just to touch on that first question, Mr. Muir asked three very important questions uh, because the, the, the point or the issue about is the department using public funding uh, sensibly is raised a lot. And of course, it's uh, understandably and appropriately, and it's referenced in the NIAO report in particular in relation to uh, premises that uh, BT indicated were commercially viable and that we could see we're in the intervention area. I think it's important that the committee is just aware of the, of the process, uh, again, underpinned by governance that led to the department applying the line in the sand principle, because this, this is a key, and it's important that everybody is aware. Uh, we had, as the NIO report establishes, uh, a situation where the ITT process, the second stage of the procurement, was launched and we had a competitive bid process, so we were delighted with that outcome. That followed the market warm-up exercise where 13 telecommunications entities were interested in Project Stratum, and then we had a selection questionnaire process, uh, all on the back of the OMR, the Open Market Review, and public consultation. So we could see at that point that the intervention area was 97,000 premises strong. And we knew, based on the outline business case, that more funding would be needed to get to all of them because our OBC indicated that a combination of 165 million of public funding and supplier contribution would get to around 74,000 premises. That 74,000 premises is an important uh, benchmark, if you like. And so going into the ITT, uh, there was a, a national data refresh exercise uh, conducted by BT. And so we were made aware that uh, of new data and BT indicated that uh, a number of premises could be considered to be removed from Project Stratum on the basis that uh, more accurate speed hub data uh, uh, could uh, indicate that premises were compliant or in many cases premises were part of the commercial full fiber rollout plans for BT. So we engaged with BD UK at that uh, time and removed 18,000 premises from the intervention area. Uh, it was the right thing to do based on the premises data that uh, BT provided. And uh, so they were removed, and that's why the intervention area was reduced to 79,000. This was in January 2020. It's right at the beginning of the ITT process. Not all of the bidders were happy with us doing that, but we felt it was important that all bidders had the same information, uh, level playing field, and we extended the ITT process to take that into consideration. So a new date for the ITT deadline, the submission of bids was set. That was the 5th of May, 16 weeks after that OMR data uh, information was provided by uh, BT. Uh, and then we had an evaluation process, and I will come to this because uh, it's, um, it's fair to say it was a very complex evaluation process, and I, I think it would be helpful for the committee if I won't ramble on too long, but, but I, I would like to take you through that process because um, coverage is a, a key component, but there are 24 detailed criteria that were assessed. But 
uh, getting back to that uh, data issue, so 5th of May, we received bids, evaluation was conducted over the uh, summer period, 2020, the lockdown summer, uh, with all evaluation panel members in, in blissful isolation, evaluating over a, an eight week period, an eight to 10 week period before consensus, uh, which was then also remote, uh, managed by CPD uh, to, to evaluate the process. And then letters of intent were issued on the 10th of September. 10 days later, BT then provided information to the department, which indicated 20% of the intervention area was commercially viable. The, the information was provided in a spreadsheet uh, with FTTP alongside uh, premises. And there was a letter which was catered to a certain degree uh, saying that uh, plans are subject to, to change. Now, when we saw that 16,000 premises overlapped with the intervention area, um, we then engaged with a number of key stakeholders and getting back to that uh, governance process between September and October 2020, we engaged with BDUK, the Public Spending Directorate, the Economy Committee, Ofcom, member of the Cabinet Office um, and the National Competence Centre within BDUK uh, before uh, drawing on the line in the sand principle, which is paragraph 56 of uh, the National Broadband Scheme 2016, which uh, indicates that contracting authorities or local bodies uh, can, if premises data is provided at a, a late stage after public consultation, elect not to take that data into consideration if they feel that uh, the, there is no credibility or not enough credibility associated with it, and premises could be vulnerable. This is a state aid mechanism there to protect and preserve the integrity of the process and the ring-fenced intervention area. And in our view, it was unusual practice. I, I would like to say BT have behaved impeccably throughout this process, except for this one area where it was unusual to state, in our view, that 20% of an intervention area comprising premises that the supplier had sought public funding to get to were now co uh, commercially viable. It may be the case that funds were being diverted that uh, had been earmarked for, for stratum, or, or, or there may be other motivations. It's not for us to say if the roles had been reversed and uh, it had been BT who were successful, and uh, the other party doing the same, we would have applied the line in the sand principle. BT would be familiar with it. They've applied it 10 times over uh, the course of uh, public interventions across the UK. So that's an important point to make. The reason why those 16,000 premises, it could be 10, could be 20, the same process uh, has applied. And with everybody we engaged with, everyone accepted the department's rationale um, and we've moved on from that. Uh, I would say BDUK's chief executive also engaged with uh, BT's UK's head of infrastructure in February last year. And uh, he was surprised that, uh, that BT were resisting uh, our recommendation to apply the line in the sand principle and uh, recommended that they did so. And BT, in fairness to them, have accepted that line in the sand principle uh, because it's there for those reasons. And, and, and we have concerns about some premises that have dropped from BT's commercial rollout plans, including some we removed during that data refresh exercise. So I get back to process and playing with a straight bat and doing everything to try and protect the intervention area and ensure that nobody is left behind. So sorry, that's a long answer, but that that's, uh, addresses the point uh, referenced in the <clears throat> report. Now, if you'll bear with me on the scoring mechanism, coverage is, uh, of course, key. It's, it's, uh, we want to maximize coverage across the intervention area. But we say maximize, not 100% not wasn't the starting point because 165 million pounds wasn't a budget. We knew it would get to potentially about 74,000 premises. Uh, we were delighted with the outcome of both bids, of BT's excellent bid, Fibrous's excellent bid. Uh, you know, they were um, uh, highly uh, credible bids, but there was quite a, a gap in the overall score scoring. How did we get to the gap? By assessing and evaluating 24 detailed criteria. So uh, the short answer would be that the department had absolute confidence to use the ITT terminology absolute confidence that Fibrous would get to 76,000 premises with a, a viable compliant FTTP solution applying all of the other criteria. The longer answer is that uh, coverage was weighted much higher than any other criteria. But taking into consideration previous NIO reports, we also weighted at half the coverage uh, uh, weighting financial model, uh, commercial sustainability and viability are very important considerations. 
And the other criteria would include environmental impact, uh, things like wholesale access pricing, uh, stakeholder engagement, uh, an enormous amount of detail required. And we don't compare bids, of course, when you're evaluating. You evaluate what's in front of you based on evidence and detailed responses to the criteria-based questions. Out of the 24 criteria, um, the two bidders scored equally in 18 areas. Uh, so they were either neck and neck in in 18, uh, sorry, in 14 areas, I should say. Uh, 11 of those were judgment-based scores and three were pass-fail. So, so in 14, uh, dead heated. Uh, BT scored higher in two areas, uh, coverage being one of them, um, proposing a 79,000 premises and uh, Fibrous, you know, less. Fibrous uh, scored higher in eight key criteria, including financial model, commercial sustainability and viability, environmental impact, uh, those are very important criteria, and they, they combine to form the whole. So when there is an automated scoring applied to coverage, that's got to be supported by all of the other information that would give the department enough confidence to say this public money can be used sensibly because this successful bidder will deliver what they've said on the tin. And that was the outcome. So while we, we accept that uh, you know, coverage being an automated score may look like it's a, it simplifies something as important as coverage, but it's underpinned by all of those detailed criteria which would give the department confidence or less confidence that uh, it would be delivered. The scores were 98.88 for Fibrous and 85.44 for BT. Mr. Yeah. Robbins, we, we really do need answers to be much more succinct than, than they have been hitherto, so I'm not trying to guillotine discussion or whatever, but we need answers to be succinct. We have a number of members still waiting to come in to uh, ask questions, and then we have a report to conclude today. So can I ask you, please, to, to be more succinct in your answering? Thanks. I, I will, Chair. Uh, some of the answers are very complex, so forgive me for, for going on, but I, I certainly take, uh, take that on board and will be as brief as possible. Can I just ask this one follow-up question? There is obviously, uh, it's been outlined, uh, a clawback mechanism in relation to BT. Um, how is that operating, and does the department have any confidence in relation to being able to receive those funds back? Yeah, so uh, I think we've touched on this already. There, the clawback mechanism, um, there's a figure of 14 million referred to in the audit office reports, um, 6.5 million from NIBIP, 7.5 million due under SRP. Um, they are constantly reviewed. Um, of the 14 million, I think somewhere in the order of 9 million is due to the executive, the, the balance going to BDUK, DCMS. Um, uh, the expectation is that, or our hope would be, that uh, we could go to the executive and ask for it to be reinvested in, in telecoms in Northern Ireland. We won't have final pictures on that until we get to contract endpoints for those two contracts, which, as I said earlier, is March 23 and December 24. Okay, thank you. Okay, does that conclude your questioning, Mr. Muir? Well, I think the issue, as you said, Chair, there were very long questions, and there still is remaining concerns around value for money as a result of the audit office report. Um, so I think, obviously, response has been given, but you know the fact that you know uh, a contract was let to Fibrous and then BT come back and say they're going to cover a significant number of properties, the general public will have concerns in relation to that and the fact that money was spent. So that, that remains a, a concern. Can I just add that prior to us even beginning the process, um, the CBI uh, undertook a report to sort of say, well, uh, was investment likely to take place? And their conclusion was that without some sort of public investment, uh, it was unlikely that the commercial operators were likely to move into certain areas of Northern Ireland. Um, so that was a report that they produced prior, just after the confidence and supply funding was announced. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Mr. Muir, as I said, I'm not guillotining debate or discussion, and if we need to have further sessions, that we need to have further dis uh, discussions or indeed correspondence sent, <coughs> we will discuss that uh, later in the meeting. Uh, Mr. Irwin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, um, can I say, in relation to the basic scoring mechanism, and I know it has been touched on, for me, uh, I've been in business all my life, but if I, if I go out to tender for something, I, I expect the tender to be like for like. 
it just seems strange to me that the two tenders weren't like for like in relation to the number of houses covered and one proposing to cover two and a half thousand less houses at a cost of approximately 25 million it just seemed a bit strange to me that you can score when you can do a basic scoring matrix on something when it's not like for like I'm not sure um, the assessment was on a like for like basis. Nigel has set out that there were 24 uh, aspects to the scoring. So coverage was one dimension of it. Nigel, um, maybe you well, can the, give the, some the coverage, There's 25 million pounds involved in the difference in coverage alone. Is that right? Nigel, do, 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 yes. do we want to explain, explain why the, the, the the, the scoring differential um, between BT and Fibrous, um, how it was weighted, and the fact that the 25 million refers to getting to the, the overall wider coverage? Yes, the, uh, the, the weighting took into consideration coverage. I won't repeat myself um, in terms of the, the scoring process, but uh, in brief, it's fair to say that the uh, department, based on the detailed information and evidence provided by the successful bidder, had 100% confidence that they would deliver to the stated premises, 76,000. You know, more confidence, clearly, than the other bidder's proposal to deliver to 79,000. That's not to say it wasn't a credible bid from BT. A score of 85 is very high. The score of 98 is considerably high. But also coverage of 97% which was the successful bidder's uh, proposal, is high and reached more premises than we were expecting with the available funding. Uh, premises have been removed from BT's commercial plans, which equate to around 4,000. So that's actually more than the 2,500 that we need to fund as a result of uh, the uh, fibrous proposal. But you know, that, that, that's another... Uh, matter which we may or may not come to later. Trevor or others, anything uh, you want to add so that uh, I don't get carried away here? Um, I, I, I think we go back to we, the criteria were clearly set out in the invitation to tender documentation. Um, there were uh, 24 areas that were being examined and assessed. Coverage was just one of them. Um, the state aid uh, decision or the state aid, the state aid rules that applied it um, outlined the areas that had to be assessed and also gave some indication of the weightings that could be applied. Um, we took, during the design of the procurement, you know, we, we did spend time to look at how those should be weighted um, and uh, ended up with the, what was published in the ITT. Um, the difference in the, the scoring or like for like um, then would be we were looking across there were other areas in which fibrous scored uh, higher than uh, than BT in their their bid and we were basing it on the information that had been presented uh, to the evaluation team um, so uh, as regards like for like we, we are doing a like for like based on the information in the bid documentation submitted to uh, the the evaluation panel during the procurement process thank you can I make one part of the point? And I know uh, uh, maybe you can't answer this one. Is there any room for scope in relation to the contract, the way the contract signed in relation to add-ons? I mean, we have one situation, I live in a rural constituency, one situation where there's a row of houses get available in Strato, and one house has been newly built this last couple of years. The cable is going by the front door, but they can connect the extra house. So, and, you know, the cable's actually going past the front door, but the, 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 they don't seem willing. There must be now, there may not be anything in that contract for them to add, to make add-ons to what is in place, maybe. I think we might respond to it at the moment. Um, Fibers have said to us uh, they are con continuing to keep that situation under review. At the moment, though, they are very mindful that they are contracted to deliver a service uh, to well, what was initially 76,000, it's added now with the extra 8,500 prems. And they are very focused that they are committing their resources to deliver to those premises at this stage. Um, and, and that's the focus of their efforts. They are, though, looking at uh, policies they can look at for what 
they term as new bills uh, as well at this stage. And we are expecting to see uh, some suggestions from them in the next few months on how that might be managed. Okay, thank you. Hopefully that will help. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Beggs. Uh, th thank you for your evidence uh, so far. Uh, I'm just uh, curious, Mr. Brennan, how have we come to a situation whereby uh, there's a public subsidy for uh, introduction of broadband where the, one of the telecom su suppliers has indicated that it's commercially sustainable on its own? P part of it, part of the area, a significant part they intend to install without public subsidy? Um, well, I, I, I can't comment on what has driven BT to take those commercial decisions. As I said, or as the guys have said previously, when the bids were being constructed, BT previously indicated that they were had to be included in the target intervention area because they weren't commercially viable. So that that's an internal BT um, discussion, and they would need to answer for why they have taken that decision. As I said earlier, from uh, a taxpayer perspective, uh, we have built in quite um, detailed verification systems. We've built in um, systems to uh, scrutinize all costs. There's an open book uh, principle supply, and we have clawback mechanisms built in. So um, we, we can look at the costs that fibers incur. We can benchmark those costs. We can take the expert advice of BD UK on whether they're appropriate or not. So we have all sorts of challenge mechanisms built into the contract to give assurance to the taxpayer that value for money is being is being delivered um, in areas that, as we said at the very, very start, are that are, are rural and um, less likely to be commercially viable. BT themselves said they weren't when they put their bids in. So, as I say, that question you're posing is really an internal one for BT to, to answer. There are implications for the public purse if, if two systems get built that, that we will have unnecessarily spent public money. Would you accept that? Uh, Theoretically, if two sys parallel systems can be built, then uh, there's a question there about why would BT want to do it if the taxpayer is providing infrastructure on that particular street or lane or whatever. But I'm, I'm not sure it is actually going to exist or whether, whether it's going to be a, a, a real problem that we have to address. I understand if, if a private company decides to install fibre on their own. I'm thinking of Virgin, who've done quite extensive installation within my constituency, that they get uh, a certain number of years uh, to, in order to try and recoup that, that investment. Is that correct? Where they, I'm where not they would sure. Not face competition, they would not face competition from others. I'm not sure what the nature of the, the Virgin contracts are, but my presumption would be that the provider of the wholesale network does have a contract, but there are terms that it has to apply for the provision of retail broadband so that anyone can use. But I'll, I'll bring maybe Nigel in in this one. Yes, the getting back to the 16,000 premises, uh, in some ways it's tantamount to a bidder uh, of a bridge contract uh, being unsuccessful and then proposing to build 20% of the bridge on the easy side of the river. That's not flippant. It's because these 16,000 premises uh, were required in order to build the viable financial model that formed the basis of BT's bid and Fibrous's successful bid. So if you removed them, because they're, they're widely distributed and dispersed across the intervention area, it's harder to get to the harder to reach, more expensive. We conducted an impact uh, assessment. It would have uh, potentially delayed procurement. We might have even had to have reset and repeated the entire procurement because the commercial viability of the awarded contract would have been brought into question. Uh, there would have been less uh, subsidy um, sorry, less contribution from the uh, successful bidder and uh, a large number of stranded premises. So, again, getting back to the process and the governance to protect the integrity of the awarded contract and the process, if those premises were commercially viable, uh, we believe it would have been appropriate for BT to advise us of that 16 weeks prior to the submission of their bid or during the 
procurement process when there is a channel of communication open through CPD, through e-tenders and I, in the form of clarification questions. In defense of BT, they're a commercial operator and, and may have decided that uh, you know, they, they, they wanted to uh, go to these premises perhaps to, to make the, the landscape more interesting. Um, and in defense of BT, the OMR was conducted a long time ago. There will be more agile OMRs, I believe, in the future. But in 2020, in January 2020, we did accept updated information as part of a data refresh exercise. So the information provided in September was out of sync with that and was unusual. To avoid all of this, uh, if this contract had been pr uh, protected in the conventional manner that other new networks would have been protected, would that not have solved the problem? I'm not sure what you what you mean by that, Mr. Beggs. How 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 would you, a different you're guaranteed uh, uh, use of of a network without competition for a certain period to recoup costs. And sorry, in this contract, um, th there isn't that protection uh, for exclusive use of the the network. One of the conditions of deploying this network is that. Uh, other uh, other network operators or, or, or uh, broadband service providers can avail of it, whether it's the services on them being provisioned by Fibrous as a wholesale operator, or there's also an option that uh, a passive inf infrastructure should be made available to other uh, operators if they wanted to on fair and equitable basis, which is one of the requirements of the state aid decision. Another important aspect to bear in mind is that um, the contract to Vibris was awarded in November of 20, um, but the, the state aid approval regime um, lapsed, I think, the following month in December. So that would have had significant implications for the, the procurement and the delivery. Maybe I'll bring in our BD UK colleagues, Billy or, or, or Andrew. Do you maybe want to say something where you think the procurement would have been if uh, we had missed the state aid milestone? Yeah, shall I, shall I just come back on that one, Mike? Um, okay. So um, from BD UK, one of the roles that we fulfil is to act as the National Competence Centre for state aid um, under the EU regime and now under the UK subsidy control regime. Obviously, at the end of 2020, we were, we were moving out of the EU um, arrangements and into the new UK arrangements. The state aid decision that Nigel has referred to earlier was made in 2016 by the European Commission. And that's referred to as National Broadband Scheme 2016. That effectively delegated responsibility from the European Commission to BDUK to confirm compliance with the EU state aid regime. And that lapsed at the end of 2020, which was also coincident with the, um, the exit from the EU. Subsequent to that, there was a bit of a gap which has now been filled by the new UK subsidy control arrangements, which in reality are still very similar to the old EU regime. But if the contract, if the Strat Stratton contract had not been agreed in, in November 2020, there would almost certainly have been a, been a delay in early 2021 before the new requirements and regime became clear. Uh, Thanks for the information. I, I'm astonished that BT will be able to access this, this fibre, and yet they're considering installing their own fibre. But that, that seems very, very strange. I assumed that they wouldn't have been able to get access to it. Uh, on a different area then, um, the 6,000 uh, premises which were not on the LPS uh, uh, database, presumably these are all premises which were not paying any rates. Uh, no, uh, the, the issue uh, relates to how the premises had been classified uh, on the pointer data set. Um, and uh, we, we then had to go back and we were actually using rating information uh, to try and merge. So, so we'll lose, we use that as part of the evidence to uh, include the uh, additional 6,000. Sorry, can, can you please explain uh, what, what, how have they been classified? I don't understand if they're not paying rates. No, no, it's, no they, what we used was rating information to include these premises. So they, they were in pointer, um, but they just hadn't been classified. They were being classified as uh, uh, not built or approved. And then we used the rating information just to sort of confirm, is, is that actually the case? And that's, that's how those additional premises came in 
so I'll do it, the project. So is this vacant site or derelict property then? Uh, all we can go, all we can say is that the pointer data set um, was saying that there was uh, not built or approved, but there actually had was something on that site. Right. Okay. Can I just come in? It does seem an extremely high figure of six thousand across uh, the piece, and to be in that category, I think you would agree, Mr. Forsyth. We were surprised at the, the 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 numbers, and we have been working with LPS to understand uh, how the pointer data set gets updated and refreshed, um, and how to improve the quality of the information that we uh, abstract from the the data set. Can, just turning to the to the areas that have been uh, designated for project stratum, um, can you advise how you selected those areas uh, as being qualifying with less than 30 megabits per second? And I say that as someone who is less than 10 megabits per second and does not appear to be included in the area. Um, I'm to me um, the. The process uh, is set out in the NBS 2016. The first part was for us to consult with the infrastructure providers we were aware of operated in the area. So we went to the likes of OpenReach, Virgin Media, some of the wireless in, uh, uh, infrastructure providers to ask them if they could provide us information on the uh, coverage that they had of their uh, networks. Um, we then combined that with the uh, Property information. We uh, we involved uh, people from uh, the ordnance survey to help us uh, match those records together. Um, that gave us the initial list of postcodes where we believed intervention was required. Um, we then uh, undertook a public open market review of that. We published that information on our website. We invited respondents to uh, reply to that. We also then liaised with the local councils to inform, ask them, look, these are our lists. Do these seem appropriate? Uh, we also invited members of the public to uh, inform us if there were any premises that they thought should be included. We had an advertising campaign as well across the province. Uh, and we also wrote to uh, key stakeholders to inform them of this process. Uh, and opportunities for them to inform us if they thought uh, we had uh, omitted anything, and, and to inform us if they thought areas should or premises should be included. Okay, I obviously missed all that, so I did. <laughs> um, in, in terms of um, basic broadband, uh, more than two megabits per second, um, Northern Ireland has only 98 per cent, whereas GB has 100 per cent. At the completion of this project, what percentage of properties will remain in Northern Ireland untouched by project stratum or without even a basic broadband? Uh, sorry, I, th I think we, we expect um, that uh, at the end of this with basic broadband, the technology, there's a whole area of raft of technologies now coming on to play onto into the market as well. Um, we expect that a basic broadband service um, should be available to most of the premises across Northern Ireland, um, but it, it'll also depend on things like, uh, I suppose, we, we are able to identify the respective premises. We'll be reliant on information from uh, the communications market review, the work that Ofcom does in informing us as to what the availability and rollout of services are. Um, we focus that the uh, superfast or the NIPIP is focused on providing superfast services uh, to uh, premises in Northern Ireland. What is your I target just... figure? I haven't heard a target <laughs> figure. What, will it be 100%? Well, just, uh, just to give you some insight into how transformative, you know, Stratum has been and the previous interventions have been, Mr. Begg. So, the the Ofcom figures from September uh, last autumn show, for example, in terms of uh, 
gigabit capable uh, premises in all, the figure for Northern Ireland is 73%. The other figures like UK average is only 40, England 38, Scotland 47, Wales 30. And in terms of access to full fibre, um, uh, you know, we're three times higher than any other region at 67%, the UK average only 24%. But so I, in I'm terms asking of the question about the lower end. So, so will we have at least achieved 100%? Will all of these properties with very poor service uh, have gotten improved service. What's the target figure, or is there no figure? Is there no target? I'm, I'm t t trying to understand what you mean by improved service. Um, well, well, there, there's, at present, 98 per cent of properties have uh, at least two megabits per second in Northern Ireland. In GB, it's 100 per cent. What is the target figure at the completion of this project? I think we would say that for all premises who want a basic broadband services, they can avail of the universal service obligation from Ofcom to ask to have that service deployed by the designated infrastructure provider, which happens actually to be OpenReach in Northern Ireland. So you can't say it'll be 99% or uh, and you're not saying it's 100% either. Okay. Um, pr prior to this project, um, there were several isolated rural communities, many, where the telecom multinational companies uh, chose not to invest. There was not broadband. Frequently, there was not mobile phone signals. They were very isolated. And small independent telecom entrepreneurs uh, installed uh, Wi-Fi broadband th themselves using innovative methods very efficiently installing those services. So my question, uh, and, and that was done using BDUK uh, public money to help, help uh, subsidise it. So my question is to BDUK, in terms of this process, do you accept that this is likely to write off all that previous public investment? Uh, as I understand it, the process involved here uh, to protect an area or customers meant that you had to publicly disclose who they were. And if you did that, uh, and there were clusters, uh, B BT would then subsequently target those areas. So because of the amount of uh, administration involved and the risk of actually showing your hand to your competitors, uh, many of these Wi-Fi uh, networks, which were funded by the public purse, uh, will be uh, ultimately written off. Uh, yes, yeah, so I can respond to that. I mean, there is there is a process of upgrade of technology going on here across all parts of the UK. So going to super fast and then to gigabit coverage, and Stratum is an example of a project which is providing both super fast and gigabit coverage. The process, which others have described, does ask the suppliers to confirm their current and planned coverage so that the publicly funded interventions only go to the areas where there is no coverage. It's up to the suppliers whether or not they respond to those requests for information. The information when it's provided, so that comes into the, into the department, when that's published back out in terms of the public consultation, that will say which premises um, are, have got coverage or are planned to get coverage and which ones have not. It won't say which providers have got those plans but an operator could work, could try and work out which, you know, which, which providers are operating in different parts of the country. But if we're going to have a process whereby we do identify which, which premises need public intervention in order to get coverage, there has to be transparency in terms of the, the coverage for premises. And that does require the, the operators to take part. If they don't take part, then we can't take, you know, there is no information from them that we can use. So that's the way the process works. But the other part is obviously that if previously funded projects by whatever route are only providing basic level broadband services and the ambition now is either super fast or gigabit and we, we're now, you know, we've had the super fast ambition and we're now onto a gigabit ambition, there is now the potential that those, those interventions will overbuild those earlier networks because those, in, those earlier networks are no, are no longer providing the speed capability that we now expect to see. Just to be clear, I'm talking about networks with greater than 30 megabits capability. 
Um, it, but, yeah, so a network, a network operator that was providing more than 30 megabits per second, if they responded to the open market review and public consultation process, and they had a, a functioning network providing speeds of over 30 megabits per second, those premises should have been excluded from the intervention area for any of these interventions. My question uh, to Mike Brennan is, do you accept that uh, if those uh, networks respond at highlighting who their customers were, uh, they would then likely to be targeted by BT uh, should strat Stratum uh, not cover those areas? I, I'm not sure I'm in a position to comment on you know, the extent to which BT is going to adopt some sort of predatory practice like that. That's really for BT to take a view on. But following on from Andrew's uh, comment, you would expect as you move towards seeking to deliver uh, gigabit uh, coverage throughout Northern Ireland that you know people with uh, or providers with a lower standard um, would find themselves displaced from that market. I, I fully understand uh, things do need to change, but if there's public investment having gone in, you would expect a, a, a window of opportunity for that money, to, that funding to, to have as an opportunity to provide before being overwritten. Okay, uh, that's fine. Thank you. Okay, um, I'm not aware of uh, any other member who wishes to ask a question in terms of indications that have come to me here in the room or uh, online. So, um, at this point, um, I. Yes. Yes. Sorry, Chair. I, I've been using that many devices. I've been in and out. Sorry, I'd have missed some of the some of the conversation. That um, I just had the ability to raise the hand on this system. Uh, if I may, ask a few questions. Yes, that's fine. Thank you, Chair. Just, Mike. I just want to take you back to um, and, and like I've been in this for a long time as an MLA. I asked a number of questions of. Um, of the department in relation to this. Can, can you take me back and identify, go back right through the database? Because it seems to be an issue in terms of how the data was collected in the first place. I mean, you, you, I'm hearing it was through the rating system. Just could you outline what, where you got the information in the first place? Because that leads into why the procurement process was started. If we didn't have all the, the data now, I'm well aware of the bond, the bond hates and all the NISA issues, but I just want an overview. Obviously, unfortunately, because I've been in and out of the meeting, I've missed some of some of the answers. Could you could you just identify quickly for me where you gathered all the data for in in relation to this year process? Okay, so I suppose a. Uh, uh... A very quick summary of the process is that at the start of the consultation process, the uh, the, the various uh, companies or internet providers uh, were consulted to establish what would be the eligible area for coverage. Okay, um, given that the need was to uh, roll out into rural, largely rural areas of Northern Ireland, so it was largely the target intervention area was largely developed by uh, the likes of Openreach, uh, Fiverr, or Fiverr. So the, the key players d determined the, the target intervention area, um, and then at a later stage, the work, for example, of LPS was essentially cross-referencing and feeding into that to establish the, the, the identity of individual properties. I suppose that's a, that's a very, very simplistic high-level understanding of it. Um, no, no that, and I appreciate that. And, and I asked in the context of, so that was a starting point because, I mean, I had asked a question in the department, you know, and I got an answer back. Obviously, it wasn't, it wasn't satisfactory because now we're finding out that we didn't have all that information. Is that a fair assumption? Um, on reflection now, because it, it was bond H, uh, settlements of a thousand or less plus, which was more important, which we wanted to see, most members wanted to see the intervention was open county site. Because as soon as this program was rolled out, I, my office was contacted on, on a number of occasions to say that they were putting a fibre artery down the road, but there was still premises on that road was going to miss out. I mean, you know, that wasn't that wasn't the whole premise of, of, of the programme in the first place, or it shouldn't have been. No, the premise of the programme was to reach those places that weren't commercially viable for the likes of BT to go to. So it is, uh, as uh, 
we said earlier, it's the townlands, the hamlets of less than yeah. a thousand people. That's what we were trying to focus on. So I think it'd be fair to say that what has emerged um, over the last couple of years is that there are properties, incredibly isolated properties. And I think it was Nigel mentioned earlier that, you know, there's properties, for example, in islands, things like that have emerged that wouldn't have been identified. So um, in summary, yes, you know, the properties have emerged over the last couple of years that probably weren't embraced in when the original target intervention area um, was drawn up as part of the, the procurement process. Would that be a fair summary, Trevor? Yeah, I think we, we'll go back and so we had to look and see what property records or property information was available to us. Uh, we looked around at systems that were uh, being published and the data set that uh, we looked at seemed to have what we were seeking was one called Pointer. Um, and we then spoke to colleagues in uh, Osney to ask them, you know, this is what we want to do. And uh, th that was decided as being the data set that we could use. Um, we believed it was uh, accurate, up to date and regularly refreshed. Um, what has come to light is that um, as we, we find that some of the records contain anomalies uh, where buildings have been designated as under construction or not approved. Turns out they are built and approved. Um, and this is to do also maybe with how the whole database is uh, updated. It relies on a wide number of stakeholders to update information, um, including uh, councils, building <coughs> control, um, and, and other stakeholders. Um, so it's just trying to, and it is a, a, a massive data set to keep up to date as well. As no, regards to no, I appreciate the, that. The, the, I, I appreciate that. Sorry? As I mentioned previously, um, we've, where this has emerged that uh, fibres going down roads and there are premises there, we've been looking to see what, what's under, what, what those situations are and we're working with fibres to see if they can come up with some sort of policy to allow them to connect and we're expecting that uh, they will be able to give us some options in the next few months uh, and I mentioned that earlier uh, in this session. Uh, Trevor and Thomas, ha have you worked out a percentage of those um, premises who will not have a fiber solution, i.e. may need some kind of satellite system or, or, or a different technology? Have you worked that out right across the uh, No, that's, our, that's, that's perhaps our next project, um, which is Project Digipit, which is the uh, UK objective to uh, provide fibre to some 85%, uh, 90% of premises across the UK. Um, so that, that's what we're looking at next. At the moment, we haven't got precise figures. Um, and when you talk about fibre solutions, that then means that there are a large number of premises who are currently getting services through uh, FTTC, fibre to the cabinet, um, that you would need to be considering. And uh, as yet, we don't have details on that. Right, so just two final points. So I, I have an answer from, from the department that says Newry and Armagh, for example, uh, will reach 97% target when this program's finished. Is Can you can you stand over that? Because that's, that's what I said from the department in terms of Newry and Armagh. I can't, I can't speak for any other constituents. But I've, I've been following this fabulous program for on the broadband program for a number of years. With that number, uh, that is uh, next generation access. So that'll be a service of 30 meg or better. Um, and uh, the technology used to deliver that could be a mix of fiber to the home technology, fiber to the cabinet, or it could be even uh, services provided over uh, cable TV, such as that provided by Virgin. And, and in terms of the original uh, funding package on what do you, what will end up with. Can you give us a detail on that? What was the starting figure and what, what will the final figure be in terms of this programme? Uh, I don't have that uh, figure just to hand as to what the initial um, something probably need to come back to you on. Okay. Uh, on Stratum okay, and so, sorry, in Stratum and Total, are you looking for the costs in relation to Stratum? Yeah, yeah, and, and, and so, the, the overall... So the total project cost, I think, up until last week, were, were um, Nigel can correct me, I think it was £211 million. And um, But then we announced the additional £34 million earlier this week, which is covering the extra 8,500 um, properties. 
So, you know, uh, what was that? Um, That's great. 200 and just under 250 million. Um, so, and I think approximately 50, high 40 million, 46, 47 million that comes from fibers. The rest of it is um, a taxpayer contributions. So, That's correct, correct. Uh, yeah. Okay. 197, 197 million public funding. That's the contract value under the extension. And as Mike says, just under 250 million, around 249 million in complete cost, network bill costs, including the supplier contribution, the cost per premises of super fast uh, intervention area premises uh, is uh, 2,330. Uh, and that's uh, considerably lower than um, similar interventions. Interventions are all different, but uh, in Ireland, the national broadband plan there, their cost would be about 4,700. And the, the most rural lot in Scotland would be close to 5,000. So um, the VFM considerations and the investment in the future connectivity for Northern Ireland uh, are sound. So, so, you, so, you're saying, so you're saying you can stand over the value for money, Benson, yeah? Uh, absolutely. I believe the value for money over the, uh, the NIO report says it's too early to draw conclusions, uh, comments on the, on the, uh, the coverage. Uh, which we've, we've tried to address. But uh, over the longer term, we believe the value for money uh, will most certainly stand the test of time for Project Stratum. Uh, when you look at the cost benefits analysis of the Superfast program across the UK, uh, for example, we can see that the, uh, for every pound of public subsidy, the longer term uh, value will be between £3.60 and £5.10. Um, so that's already uh, starting to pay for itself, but also uh, benefits to e-learning, e-education, uh, health and well-being, as well as the economic benefits uh, and to businesses uh, will certainly be part of our longer term value for money assessment, along with the VFM assessments that the UK conduct when looking at the bids and uh, conducting a bid comparison report, which will combine uh, to form the VFM view in the longer term. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thanks. Um, can I just finish off with a couple of quick questions, um, if I may, uh, to Mr. Brennan as an accounting officer in the department? Um, at the time you were drawing up the target intervention area, did you understand that there were likely to be deficiencies in the LPS database? And in hindsight, uh, should you have done more in terms of due diligence on the information? Uh, to, to ensure that the figures were more accurate? Uh, sure, I, I, I wouldn't... Uh, my understanding is that those issues around LPS pointer system weren't identified and weren't understood, and our awareness of them has only evolved over the last two or three years. And as I said earlier, it's something that we've also encountered in relation to um, a number of COVID grant schemes that have used LPS pointer. It's it's something that was used for a rate system and other public bodies are now using it for something that was never intended. So it's getting more accurate, it's getting better. A lot of investment by DOF has gone into it. And um, so no, I think a quick answer to your question. No, we weren't aware of those issues. The best we could have hoped for was that the, 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 the likes of BT um, and the companies bidding into it had a perfect understanding of um, what should be in the target intervention area, and that hasn't come to pass. We know there are anomalies that exist, and that's what we're trying to address. So when you say you, you weren't aware of it, where, when did you become aware there was such a, um, a wide-scale inaccuracies in terms of the LPS database? Um, so, so I, yeah. yeah, go ahead. Yep, uh, uh, we came, became aware of it after the contract award, to just, just to go back to the basis that helped form the intervention area. Um, there was a open market review, as we've established in the summer of 2018. Prior to that, uh, the team had engaged with LPS and an LPS uh, specialist, and the terms of reference were drawn up, and it was identified that uh, a premises with uh, a category of built and approved uh, would capture the premises uh, accurately, as robustly as possible for the purposes of the intervention. Uh, and so that's the basis of the pointer data set that the department's been drawing on. Uh, at the point of state aid public uh, consultation, we received less than 30 inquiries from citizens who indicated that they were 
not included, but uh, you were living in legitimately built and approved premises and paying rates. Um, so we dealt with those on a case by case basis. <clears throat> And then following contract award and the widely publicized, uh, hyper-fast address-based uh, link that the contractor manages, the number of inquiries increased quite substantially. So we realized that uh, there were uh, more anomalies that you might expect. As Mike says, LPS and the data set are uh, not intended for these purposes, but it's still the, the most definitive address-based data set in Northern Ireland used by other government departments and the emergency services. You would expect some anomalies. There are um, close to a million pieces of data. Um, and uh, we drew on about 850,000 uh, pieces of data. So you'd expect some anomalies. But we were surprised by the number of premises that weren't categorized as built and approved. But LPS rely on information to be fed into the system by local councils and Royal Mail. And, uh, and so uh, for some reason, perhaps it was taking a considerable number of years in some cases for those premises to be updated. So we became aware of the issue, consulted with uh, LPS and the OSNI team and others, and they've been very cooperative and helpful in, uh, in helping us arrive at solutions and put forward other data sets, including the valuations lists unverified premises lists. Um, and we replicated the OMR process for those premises that based on data from infrastructure providers could not um, receive speeds of uh, 30 or above. And so that formed that uh, view of the 6,000 premises that uh, were eligible based on the same overarching policy conducted during the OMR. I would just like to say there are other data issues we, we want to continue to work through with LPS and local councils because there are some premises that are categorized as built and approved and maybe derelict. So we're working with the contractor to identify those on the ground and de-scope them, but we would much rather do it in a, a more efficient manner uh, and identify all of them rather than a, an area by area basis. But as Mike says, the quality of the data is improving and, and we all want to work collaboratively to, to ensure that it does improve. Yeah, as I, as I said to Mr. Forsyth, the figure of 6,000 seems huge uh, in, in uh, a country the size of Northern Ireland um, in the grand scale of this overall scheme. And finally, for me, um, a number of mentions have been made of the Northern Ireland Audit Office report. Can I ask, did, uh, did the department inform the Audit Office of those problems so that could be reflected in the report? Should I pick that mic up, uh, yes. Mike? Uh, yeah. Uh, 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 sorry, Chair, are you referring to the problems in relation to the yeah. pointer database specifically? Yes. yes. Yeah, go ahead, Nigel. Yes, so the terms of reference of the audit, of course, was to look at the procurement process and the contract uh, management, and we've uh, engaged very openly and transparently with uh, NIAO colleagues during the audit. There were some questions that weren't raised by the audit team. We would have certainly responded to them. The matter regarding 8,500 premises was referenced in the report in a press release that was issued by DCMS in summer, uh, which alluded to the additional yeah. funding in the 8,500 premises. Yeah. Mr. Um, Mr. Robbins, no Mr. Robbins, Mr. Robbins uh, we will be speaking to the, the Comptroller and Auditor General and his team later, uh, and we can ask those questions. I'm asking you and Mr. Mr. Uh, Brennan, did the department advise the audit office? Uh, you know, you're saying they could have asked questions. Did you provide the information? We provided information regarding the premises data that we were continuing to review and the fact that we were keeping under review the 24 million associated with the 2,500 premises. We were working through a live procurement issue and seeking approvals related to the funding allocations from DFE and DIRA to add to the DCMS funding allocations and going through approvals processes which culminated with state aid assurance and DOF assurance. And as soon as that process was completed, we provided all the information we thought was pertinent to the NIAO prior to this public accounts hearing, and then I responded to questions and had a, a telephone call as well, so they could have all the information to hand once we had secured the funding for that process. Mm. Um, but, but my question is, did you provide the information to the Audit Office um, during the process of the, the, the uh, the report, the inquiry being produced, not something subsequent. Was it provided at the time? 
it wasn't provided in as robust a fashion as it was at the point of approvals, uh, but there were other areas like premises under review that uh, weren't uh, discussed, uh, which are live procurement issues uh, as well. So that's why we felt it was appropriate to bring this to their attention as soon as approvals uh, were secured outside of the procurement process, which was being audited. Okay. Um, can I just ask at this stage if either Mr. Donnelly or Mr. Stevenson from the TOA would like to make any comment? Uh, no, uh, I will make a comment on the, you know, the, pro the anomalies with the LPS tracker system. Uh, the first I heard about that was in the department's press release uh, last week. I would expect that type of material information to be disclosed automatically without my people asking for it. It goes without saying. It's as simple as that. Mm. I have to say, I have to say, as chair of this committee. I think there's some veracity in that comment. Um, gentlemen, uh, Mr. Stevenson, is there anything you would like to say or any questions you'd like to ask? You seem to be on mute, Mr. Stevenson. Sure, if I could just add a very brief conceptual point. Um, I'm conscious a couple of members asked about clawback, and uh, I think it's just worth um, referring to the, the, the guidance that would kind of govern uh, that area would be the, the in-year monitoring guidance. Um, and I, it's refreshed on an annual basis, but there is some long-standing conventions and the, the area that covers reduced requirements, I it would be one of those conventions and I don't expect it to change uh, between now and the timing on the, on the clawback issues. Um, Basically, the, the, the advice is that departments flag up any reduced requirements in excess of a million pounds, and it feeds into the public expenditure process. So we would expect uh, in the early part of the relevant financial years, the clawback of, of this nature to be flagged up, and, um, and that would feed into the executive decision-making process on the allocation. Um, so it would be nothing precludes the Department for the Economy bidding for, for, the, for that money, uh, but it will be probably an executive decision uh, as to whether to return it to the department. And that will depend on the other pressures that exist at the time and also probably the, um, the, the strength of that bid uh, coming forward. But I just thought that would be helpful to set out at this stage. Okay, thank you very much. Well, just at this stage then, um, can I just thank Mr Brennan uh, for your attendance today uh, as the Permanent Secretary and Accounting Officer at the Department of the Economy. Economy and thank the local department representatives and those from the National Department of DCMS for their time and their contributions this afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, gentlemen, and thank you very much. Um, Mr. Steve Mr. Stevenson, you can also um, uh, leave us as well. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Thanks, Chair. Okay. Members, then, with your permission, uh, we will go into closed session for the next uh, item of the agenda, the discussion on the evidence you have just heard, and we will then remain in closed session for the remainder of your meeting. Agreed? Agreed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Signed.